Um, so welcome to this talk, which is titled Broken Stack, OpenStack Failure Stories. Um, we're here to talk about why OpenStack deployments fail and what you can do to try and avoid or, or at least increase the chances of success with OpenStack deployments. Um, I'll, I'll do the super fast, boring introduction. I'm John Kelly. This is Jason Grimm. This is Chris Rivera. We're all uh, solutions architects with Cisco Metapod now, but I used to work at Rackspace, and he used to work at Rackspace and Mirantis, and he used to work at Piston. Um, so we've been doing the OpenStack thing for a long time and have witnessed many OpenStack failures firsthand. And, you know, I used to have hair before I started working on OpenStack. <laughs> <clears throat> So what, it, what is broken stack? Um, I think most of us here, if, if you've worked in an operational role on OpenStack, you have experienced uh, the, the state of broken stack. We're, we're defining it here as a failed state or result of an attempt to launch an OpenStack-based cloud, um, also as an expletive used to describe an OpenStack deployment or service not working as anticipated, uh, typically accompanied by profanity, uh, a lot of profanity. Um, I know my Rackspace friends back there can vouch for this. <coughs> <clears throat> something is wrong with my private cloud. So you guys have probably all seen the uh, <laughs> news articles that say, Gartner says 95% of all private clouds fail, um, which is not exactly correct. And so if there are any Gartner people in the audience, I'm not actually saying that Gartner said that. But what Gartner did find um, was that 95% of private cloud deployments have issues. When, when people are asked, are you satisfied with your private cloud, 95% of people report that there are issues with their private cloud that they're not satisfied with. Um, so when, when you look at that statistic, if I were to tell you, OK, you're going to try and create your own private cloud, you have a 1 in 20 chance of actually being satisfied with the result. Um, would you still proceed with that? I mean, that seems like pretty terrible odds to me, right? Um, so <clears throat> what we're going to talk about here is we've got three case studies of companies that have successfully or unsuccessfully deploy, deployed private clouds. Uh, we, went, we went to customers, to, to people we've worked with in the past, and we interviewed them, and we asked, you know, what were you trying to do? What didn't work? What could you have done differently that would have allowed you to be successful? Um, <clears throat> so we're going to take those case studies and extrapolate some lessons learned. Um, and from those, we're going to give you guys some, some keys to success. What things do you need to do to try and minimize the chances of failure and maximize the chances of success in deploying OpenStack? <clears throat> so for our first case study, um, these are all anonymous. The, the names have been changed to protect the innocent. Um, obviously, it was difficult to find someone who wanted to come forward and say, yeah, we had a terrible failed OpenStack deployment, and we want to put our name on that publicly in front of hundreds of people at the OpenStack Summit. Um, so I hope you'll forgive that. This is a, a financial services company, um, and the gentleman I interviewed for this actually did uh, OpenStack deployments for two separate financial services companies, um, one of which was successful eventually, um, and the other which failed miserably. Um, <clears throat> in this instance, the thing that brought about the need for a private cloud, or the perceived need for a private cloud, um, was needing to reduce time to market slash time to value, and that, that's a common thing that you'll see um, for migration from you know, VMware or Mode 1 IT to Mode 2 IT, right? They had issues with really slow release cycles, six months a year per release. Um, it would take weeks for them to get firewall rule changes, load balancer rule changes, VM provisioning took days. You know, they had these heavyweight manual approval processes with the security team. Um, and I'm sure you know, all of you have experienced this because these are the pains of traditional IT, right? And, and a lot of the reason why you know, we have cloud now in the first place. Mm -hmm. So after putting a, a huge amount of money and effort into this project, um, the primary issues that they ran into uh, can be broken down into three groups, right? The first one was staffing issues. Um, they attempted to do this with four full-time heads um, with the thought process that they'd be able to take some VMware admins, stuff like that, cross-train them to help support the platform. Um, what they found was that realistically for 24-7 production workload, they would need a bare minimum of eight full-time heads focused entirely on OpenStack. Um, they found that it, it wasn't just operations that these guys were doing. Um, because they were, this was earlier on in, in the days of OpenStack, um, and they wanted bleeding edge. They wanted current projects and everything. Um, so they had to manage their own packages. They had to do their own upgrades, uh, which is, is quite a bit of work, right? So, so their guys, these four guys were doing that. 
They were managing operations, keeping the cloud running. And the other thing that they had to deal with <clears throat> that they hadn't quite anticipated was the amount of enablement and support for end users that they had to do. Because operationally, OpenStack is very different than VMware. And so when you have a user base that's accustomed to inter interacting with VMware via service desk tickets or a, you know, a nice UI, um, there's some you know, end user education that's required to, to move them to you know, Horizon and APIs, right? <clears throat> um, the other big problem they found was that they couldn't just cross-train VMware admins to be OpenStack admins. Um, to be a effective OpenStack admin, uh, you basically need to be a full stack engineer, right? You, you need admin skills, you need at least light development skills, the abil ability to read and troubleshoot Python. Um, you need security, monitoring, storage knowledge, uh, a, a broad skill set that is not generally widely present within an organization. Um, and so they found that they needed to bring in outside talent <clears throat> and that that outside talent was expecting salaries that were you know, basically twice what they were paying their normal admins. Um, so they had some major staffing issues there, which leads us to inadequate budget. <clears throat> when this project was launched, the budget um, was allocated between hardware and manpower and everything. And you know, they bought a lot of hardware, um, thinking that they would be able to get by with four full-time heads. And you know, in reality, that, that was not the case. And I'm not sure how many of you guys have run into a, a similar circumstance. Um, but I mean, we all know operating open second production is hard. Um, it, it's, it's not VMware, right? It's not a black box solution that just kind of, just kind of works. Um, it requires a lot more care and feeding. And the care and feeding it requires requires a level of technical expertise um, significantly greater than than what a VMware engineer or even a VMware architect requires. <clears throat> Finally, we get to uh, institutional hurdles, right? Uh, resistance to change. So, so you can build this platform, um, but if there are groups that are still, you know, change equals risk, right? Like we've always done it this way. We've got this process that works for us. Why should we change the way that we do things? You know, like. We, it, it's taken us, you know, we've had a three-day manual VM provisioning process for years now. Like, why can't we just keep doing that for the next 20 years, right? Um, you also have people who try and force old operational or architectural models, you know? Well, you know, if this server dies, I want my application to automatically fail over at the infrastructure level without me having to do anything. You know, I don't want to implement, implement monitoring or, you know, anything like that. I just want it to happen magically, you know? Well, that's what VMware is for, right? <clears throat> And uh, you know, on the security side, um, in my experience, that's been the hardest part because you have companies that have a very traditional approach towards security. You know, they're used to manual approval processes where you put in a ticket, et cetera, et cetera, and that completely defeats the purpose of an API-driven cloud, right? <clears throat> Finally, um, last but not least, fear of automation um, and or inadequate staff to implement automation. So people just saying, you know, well, you know, what if the script breaks something, right? Because we all know that well-written automation fails more often than people doing things manually, um, <laughs> right? Um, or, you know, the, the teams that actually, you know, yeah, we'd love to automate this, but we're basically all working 60 hours a week right now and we don't have the bandwidth to do that and we have no additional headcount, right? So how are we gonna automate this stuff? Um, <clears throat> in a nutshell, the, uh, to, to summarize the lessons learned, right? OpenStack's not a VMware replacement. Um, the people expecting VMware-like experience, VMware-like um, hardware-mediated HA um, will be sorely disappointed. Um, cutting edge comes at a cost. If you wanna be you know, running cutting edge software, maintaining especially your own packaging, patches, et cetera, um, staffing is hard and it's expensive. Um, third point, uh, before committing a multi-million dollar budget to trying to launch a private cloud, um, build a, a small cloud and, and test fit for purpose. Make sure that your teams are actually going to be able to consume this in a useful manner, that they're gonna be able to adapt their operational processes in a way that will allow them to, to use it meaningfully. Um, finally, and I think this was the best point um, that the gentleman I interviewed on this made was consult with those who've already been successful. He said, I wish I would have gone to other people in the industry who we know have had successful private clouds and talked to them because in retrospect, having done so, they ran into the exact same problems we did and I think we could have saved a, a lot of time and a lot of money if we had just done that in the first place. Mr. Grimm. All right. <clears throat> so, Dub use the clicker. Oh, the arrows. Um, 
I can, I can deploy multi-region uh, OpenStack, but the mute button in a PowerPoint uh, <laughs> escapes me a lot. Uh, thanks uh, for a big turnout. You, you never want to present before lunch, or people you say you never want to present between you know you and the and, and the person's lunch. But we're between us at the end of the day and beer. Um, so uh, thank you for for coming out and uh, listening to us. So case study number two is a major uh, telecom service provider um, in, uh, in, in the US, uh, specifically in the southeast. But So their goals uh, were to reduce cost and, and increase capacity. Um, they were coming from a, a legacy VMware and bare metal environment, but they didn't have any uh, multidiscipline workloads. Um, not an easy way to share uh, compute, network, and storage um, capacity. And uh, you know, through that, they wanted to drive higher utilization and, and drive higher consolidation uh, through that process. They also wanted to reduce time to market, uh, much like the first case study. Typical of um, waterfall development processes, typical of ITSM and service catalog, um, or even, even basic um, uh, orchestration and automation. In the environment, it's still a very slow process uh, without uh, self-service uh, API, uh, web UI, and CLI, and uh, all, all the automation there for, for self-service. So they wanted to uh, increase uh, time to value. They wanted to go from taking months to deploy a, a platform to maybe even days or, or hours, from a pretty typical use case or, or desire. Um, they wanted an agile, uh, friendly development environment. They were shifting from, um, again, traditional waterfall, um, development and deployment processes to uh, more of a CICD and agile uh, based environment. Um, again, they wanted a self-service UI and, and CLI and API for both their cloud admins and cloud operators, their developers and their, their end users. Uh, so the environment was two regions and four availability zones, um, two for dev test and, and two for prod per region, around 100 hypervisors. Um, you know, pointing back to the first uh, use case, going with the Big Bang, um, and, and I don't know if we call this out uh, directly in the lessons learned, but going for a Big Bang approach, um, probably not the best uh, methodology to go. It's like uh, if you're going to fail, fail fast and fail often and iterate quickly, uh, and you can do that with a 16 or 32 node uh, environment much more quickly, easily than you can with a 100 node uh, environment. So the primary service for this new platform was SIP and, and VoIP services. Um, lastly, they went with a vendor-managed uh, OpenStack consumption model. We'll talk about that a, a little bit later. So, the you know all everything everything looks good. It was very nice. They had executive sponsorship and budget. Uh, they had a, a, a good uh, level of adoption and a good culture fit. Uh, they had good dev and platform tools. They were going from uh, a, a lot of uh, roll your own uh, Perl and, and and Bash and kind of one-off scripts to the, they decided on Ansible as a standard for provisioning and configuration management. Um, they did, it was a big environment that they put in, but it was a very conservative uh, migration uh, uh, approach where they started with a less than 1% workload and, and moved up from there. <clears throat> Lastly, they went with a managed service. Um, you know, we're, I'm not saying that DIY is bad or distro-based solution is bad or managed service um, you, you know, is the, the panacea or the, the absolute best way to go. Um, but from your first foray into it, it's not a bad option because uh, of the staffing issues and because of the investment and, and time to value and time to market uh, and not getting your staff poached and things like that. It's not, that was, uh, I'm putting that in the check column as, as, a, as a good approach to go. So, so what happened? They all, everything looked good here. So the, the major issue, again, was a, a lift and shift mentality. So 90% um, of the 95% of, the of failure rate, uh, rate is around culture, uh, adoption, uh, leadership, uh, tools, and, and, and all those things. Everything was lined up good. The only thing that they, that they kind of skipped on was they did a, a lift and shift of um, how they did their workload today. They automated it, and they added orchestration to it, but in the end, it was 128 gig um, instances that were vertically scaled uh, um, um, a Java application, and uh, and I won't uh, call out the third-party ISV um, uh, SIP provider, uh, and and it, that that didn't really matter. But the the SIP provider and and I can I can say who the managed service provider was. It was it was us. Uh, so I can't mention the customer, but um, 
Cisco and the third party ISV said, you know, you can run large vertical instances. We do it with Hadoop, we do it with HPC. I mean, it's not, it wasn't that the, the vertical instance was the problem, it was that the way the application was interacting and it came down to some Java issues, but they decided not to re-architect, we'll just take what we have and we'll, and we'll move it over. So when the load was between one and 49%, for that, so let's say for the first 12 to 15 months that it was up and running, everything was great. Uh, performance was great, consolidation was great, um, higher you know, utilization, uh, everything was, was running fine. At, at 50%, <clears throat> so I, and I can't remember specifically what it was that the, the last fat kid in the pool, it was something like 4,000 sessions, uh, active sessions per uh, hypervisor. All of a sudden, the, the, the time went from a, a 20% or 20x decrease <clears throat> in, in time, which caused uh, jitter, uh, call drops. Uh, it, was, it was essentially, it, it tanked the, the entire uh, platform, and this is now they're they're in production with this, and now it's a now it's a crisis, and, and now it's an issue. <coughs> Excuse me. So it took thousands of, of man hours, literally, um, between the uh, physical operating system um, um, support ISV, the the, the the operating system within the instance, the the the, vi the VoIP uh, application, the managed service provider. Hardware, uh, OEM, all the on-site engineers. Literally, it took six weeks uh, of all of us, you know, digging in uh, to this. What turned out to be was a Java uh, garbage collection uh, process that, that that happened that caused uh, all the time, and it, and it came down to NUMA alignment. Um, but it took weeks to get down to that because you've got literally hundreds or even thousands of, of attributes trying to trying to debug this this specific issue. Um, and I mean. Oh, and the other, the other challenge was they weren't on uh, Kilo or later yet. Oh, keep going? Or keep, go faster. <laughs> I'll speed up. <laughs> um, they, weren't, they weren't on Kilo yet, so they didn't have, a NUMA, they didn't have the NUMA scheduler. Um, they were on Juno, um, and they're on Liberty now. And and, but the, the short-term solution was a very low-tech uh, thing, which was to pull one of the processors out of the box and force uh, NUMA alignment. We were trying to do all these things, but anyway. Um, so the, the lessons I learned here, again, OpenStack is not uh, VMware, and the, uh, the organizations that say, I want a, 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 you know, a better, cheaper, faster uh, VMware, it's, yes, it's virtualization. Uh, yes, you have virtual networks, you have virtual IPs and things like that. Um, but take the time to, to do things right. Re-architect your application uh, so that it's also a good fit. In the end, it would have been multiple times easier uh, cheaper and faster to take the time to re-architect the application versus getting 15 months down the road um, and literally tanking the whole platform. Now, the black eye, the, this isn't technically, technically a broken stack. I'll, I'll call it a near, a near broken stack because the, the C-level management was ready to scrap the entire project. I mean, they had made a strategic direction, millions of dollars, you know, thousands and thousands of hours to, to move to this, everything was fine. Literally almost... Uh, pulled the OpenStack initiative out altogether. Chris. Thanks, Jason. Um, this last case study is really focused around a very large media company that's had numerous acquisitions throughout the years, uh, mostly speaking with a CIO and a vice president of data centers. Um, so what was actually happening is all these product leads from these companies they've acquired, the DevOps leads, they were demanding you know, more agile environment, they wanted more speed, and very importantly, they wanted root access which typically wasn't provided to the end users who are spinning up virtual machines and doing development. So they evaluated some different solutions and they settled on OpenStack. Sounds great. Um, they actually took, I thought, a great approach. They were gonna do it themselves. Um, what I mean by that is they were very, they took a very conservative approach. They weren't installing um, the latest release with all the bells and whistles. They had planned on the specific features that they needed, um, the storage tiers, the networking that was well thought out in advance. So they were considering the upgradability of that cloud. So things are looking pretty good so far. Um, but what we actually found was it was really, because the company was so large, a lot of it was these issues, which I think kind of analogous to, you know, state rights for states' rights versus federal government, 
where they had a bunch of these different uh, teams almost competing with corporate IT. And all these little teams wanted to do things their own way, and corporate IT was kind of mentioning something else. But what we actually found out when they rolled out this, this private cloud was that the dev groups didn't fully grasp the implications of having raw access to the infrastructure. Um, and what do I mean by that is they didn't realize that once we get this raw access to the infrastructure with root access, we now have to worry about security. And there were organizational issues such that who would be responsible if there's some sort of security compromise, right? Is it the corporate IT or is it the individual people running the virtual machines with root access? Um, who's going to take care of the patching? And who's going to take care of some of the third-party configuration, integration with repositories, et cetera? So the kind of biggest gap in this case was that once this functionality was provided to the end users, they quite weren't ready to embrace it, right? They, they have to worry about security, patching, configuration, et cetera. Um, and looking further into that, what we found was that existing corporate IT probably could have done a better job marketing those services and also outlining the current uh, burden that their team takes on. So they could have you know, gotten together with the, all their teams, consolidate all the feedback, and then say, look, we're going to provide root access. Here's the implications. These are the tools that we're using for patching and security. We can help your team get those up and running, but your team needs to be prepared to take care of this themselves. Um, and one of the other things was they said that a quick start guide would have been immensely helpful because you're taking these people who are used to working in the existing infrastructure, they're demanding cloud and agility, but then they weren't quite ready to ramp up and start, getting, start using it right away. So we kind of talked about if they had some sort of quick start guide, here's some of the common workflows that people are going to do. Here's how you execute those common workflows on this new, on this new platform. And I think it's... Okay, well, uh, I talked too long on the last one. We're going to speed up here. So um, on, on lessons learned, uh, what we're going to do is, well, uh, as we go through the second half of this, um, we're going to kind of break things out into, um, you know, the five leading causes of, of broken stacks or, or open stack private cloud def uh, failures. In our mind, in our experience, it comes down to uh, staffing uh, issues or challenges, operational hurdles, uh, time to value, the, the, you know, choosing the right consumption model, and uh, uh, failure to adapt uh, the, an, an operational model. So staffing challenges. Um, so the, the, the cost available, uh, you know, time, the, the time to value to, to either find the staff, acquire them, or train them internally, uh, pay disparity versus existing staff. Um, this is a, a, a huge issue, I would say, with 100% of the customers um, that I've been working with in the last uh, five years, even from small born in the cloud shops that are repatriating a workload to um, you, you know, net new greenfield uh, open tech cloud for, folks. Um, so but, so <laughs> the, the usual steps of doing this probably the, the wrong way is, you know, step one, you acquire the, the talent. It, 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 it's, hard to, it's hard to find, um, and it's, they're expensive to hire. And if you look at a, like a supply-demand chart, OpenStack's not commoditized, and, and staffing for OpenStack is even less commoditized. So you, it's doing it by itself. I think they're clicking me through the slides, making me go fast. Um, very high demand, very low supply. The ergo, very high cost and a lot of um, movement and, and but, you know, of, of engineers between companies. But, um, you know, you try and mitigate, uh, you, you, you uh, address pay disparity in the staff. Um, you try, once you, re, you know, once you get the, the talent, it's doing it by itself again. Once you get the talent, re, retaining the talent to, to prevent poaching is, is difficult to do. You've got to, you know, continue to make it not just, um, Fiscally interesting for them, but give them good good workloads and good challenges, um, so that they you know they are interested to stay to stay around. It's not all uh, about the money all the time, um, but working on a on a good project. But typically, that you lose the talent and you have to kind of return to step one. So the second part of this, these are this is real. And again, we won't mention company names, but um, <laughs> this this it really happens, and I actually couldn't even fit all the, the people on the slide. There's about 18 uh, people over a 90-day period going from a major uh, telecom to a, a major re retailer. And this was around 18 of their 20-ish or so top uh, OpenStack talent. Um, 
And no one, the, uh, us in the community talk about this stuff because everyone knows somebody and we talk about it. Could not find any story published on it, but if you actually go out, this is based on a LinkedIn um, analysis. So, um, so uh, you know, another one, whoops. So, uh, it, it, you know, another one went from uh, an OpenStack provider to, to a major networking company. Um, again, what, if you've built a, a, a product or service, right, if you're, if you're delivering whatever it is, um, uh, Ferraris or, or Tupperware or anything, and, and someone comes and takes 90% of your talent in a, in a 90 to 100 day period, totally disruptive, um, more disruptive than than losing hardware, more disruptive than, than losing a site, because those are the people that care and feed uh, for what you're working on and, uh, and are ultimately responsible for the success or failure of your cloud. Okay, so <clears throat> I'll cover the next two causes of failure. So failure to adapt operational models. This, according to Gartner, is the most common cause of failure uh, in private cloud deployments. So 31%. Um, is the number that they quote, where this is the primary factor. Um, and this, you know, when, when we say VMware is not OpenStack, this is really what we're talking about, right? <clears throat> um, we're talking about, uh, you know, traditional methodologies, wa waterfall versus agile. We're talking about pets versus cattle. Um, and, and one of the big issues that we see time and time again is um, if your application relies on the infrastructure for, for HA um, and you just lift and shift into OpenStack, you're... <laughs> Spoil, spoil my great next slide. I don't, it's, yeah. Anyway, <clears throat> you're going to have a bad time, right? And, and, you know, if you haven't accounted for refactoring your application and building it in a more cloudy manner, um, you're going to have a bad time, right? If you're expecting cheap VMware out of OpenStack, you're definitely going to have a bad time. And I can't tell you the number of people who've come into it with that expectation. It's like, it's like open source VMware for free. It's like, no, it is nothing like that whatsoever. Like, um, yeah, I, I had a great experience with a, a customer where I had to explain to them that they were under the impression, you know, they said, well, it's not like if one of AWS's physical servers goes down, all the instances on it go down. And, and I was like, yes, that is exactly what it's like. And they were just completely confused. Like, well, doesn't that mean that everyone running on AWS would constantly be having outages? I'm like, okay, we need to take about 100 steps back and, and explain exactly what cloud is and why you should be thinking about this. <clears throat> Time to value is another really big one, right? Uh, you can succeed and still fail if it takes you too long, or if after having stood up your cloud, it takes you too long to patch, to upgrade, to, to stay up to date with OpenStack. If you're still running on Essex today, which I know there are people out there still running on Essex today, um, that's probably not success as any of us would define it, right? Um, there are a number of factors here, right? Technical difficulties. Um, is your app actually suited for running in the cloud? Um, <clears throat> How do you manage VMs, right? VM lifecycle management in the cloud is very different than it is in VMware, um, et cetera, et cetera. There are political difficulties, right? Who's the sponsor for this cloud project? Um, is it someone who, who has a vested interest in preventing any change and maintaining the status quo because change is risk, right? Or is it someone who's trying to make a name for themselves and say, hey, I stood up this giant private cloud within my company and not really concerned about the long-term success of the project, but just looking for a feather in their cap so they can jump to a higher level position somewhere else? Um, in addition, like, are people actively obstructing the project internally? And these are things that we all run into as, as solutions architects on a daily basis. Like, this is just ubiquitous, and I'm sure many of you have encountered this as well. Um, security is another big thing. Traditional security teams do not like cloud. They, they don't like the concept of self-service, of people using APIs to provision VMs. You know, people, developers having root on a VM, like, whoa, right? And, uh, and so a lot of times, even if you can get a cloud stood up, the corporate security team says, well, no, 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 before you can provision a VM, you need to put in a ServiceNow ticket, and it needs to go to these seven people, and you know, a month later, you'll actually be, you know, and, and so that can kill a cloud more than, than anything else, right? And finally, legal, uh, that's especially applicable if you're looking to go with like a distro-based or managed service solution. Um, if the legal team's not on board and, and able to you know, sign off on that, um, not really understanding open source or anything like that. Um, those are common issues that can cause major problems. Chris? All right, <clears throat> All right so a little bit more on the consumption models. Um, I kind of like this slide because it does a great job comparing the different options, right? So let's say you're sold on OpenStack. There's a few different options. Um, first and foremost, we've been talking about do-it-yourself OpenStack. And you know, this is, this is great for some people. 
uh, you evaluate your needs and you determine that you need cutting edge, you need access to the latest projects, then that's fine. You can you know, roll OpenStack yourselves, but you need to be prepared for, you know, to maintain the OpenStack skill set, the expertise that's going to require, um, the operational complexity, and also the support is pretty much all being handled by your team that's doing this deployment and accordingly your SLAs. On the other side, you have a full managed OpenStack, which is going to be a bit different. Lots of times, those aren't going to be the absolute latest release. It's not going to have the latest cutting edge features, but it tends to be uh, more robust and highly available. So, you know, the SLA can be as high as, you know, four nines or whatever, depending on the vendor. And the other thing is you're lots of times going to get the full stack support, and it's not going to require all the OpenStack skill sets, with the idea being you just want the capabilities of cloud, have someone else make sure it's always up and running, and you can focus on your business running on top of that set. And kind of in between there, you have the various OpenStack distros. Um, coming from, I came from Piston Cloud Computing, as we mentioned earlier, we had a number of instances sometimes where we would you know, partner with the SDN vendor, we work across numerous hardware, and sometimes that could get really difficult if there was some sort of issue, how do you go about troubleshooting the root cause? Well, the customer would open a ticket with us because we were you know, the OpenStack guys. We start digging into it, we find it's some misconfiguration network, it could be SDN. We don't have to take that ticket, open up a ticket with the other vendor. They start looking into it, and then maybe they determine, they determine it's some misconfiguration on the switch, which you have to kick that ticket back over to the customer in the end. So the customer is kind of frustrated because they're working with all these different parties. So that's just something, something else to consider um, for the operational hurdles. And as we've been talking about VMware, so the thing about VMware is you know, everyone's very familiar with it. Um, it's understood within the organization. It's already widely deployed, heavily used, et cetera. So we can walk through, I like to consider a quick example, because again, OpenStack is not VMware. Let's look at launching an instance. So if you're you know, launching an instance in VMware, lots of times it's you know, select the image, choose the storage type, select network, click start, or next, next, next paycheck, as I think someone was telling me earlier. <laughs> and it's actually designed in such a way that you're limited to the specific options, and it's kind of fail-proof in terms of launching a VM. How would you do the same thing in OpenStack? Well, select the flavor, select the boot source, the key pair, choose a security group, pick a network, and click launch, right? Easy enough. You do all that, and great, I launched, I launched my first OpenStack instance. But as I'm sure many people can relate to here, you probably saw something more like this. You tried to launch an instance, you got this error. Uh, maybe not that one, maybe you got another one where you know, the flavor, you were trying to launch an instance that was too big for a flavor, or vice versa. Maybe this. This one's particularly useful. It's in no state. Um, and so you're, you're kind of left feeling like this. And I, I think this is, this is quite interesting because it took me a long time to just kind of understand how all this stuff worked. And now that you've been working with it for a certain period of time, you're, it's a little more comfortable. So I can you know, get in front of OpenStack and we know, okay, I have to find or create an OpenStack friendly image. Well, what, what does that mean? If it's a Linux-based instance, that can be quite easy, just download. Uh, if it's Windows, you might have to create your own. And then once you have that image, you need to upload it into your environment. Well, lots of times images can be rather large. You can't just click upload image. You have to do it via the CLI, which means you need the OpenStack CLI. And depending on what cloud you're connecting to, it may have SSL endpoints. It could be different versions of OpenStack. You could need different versions of the OpenStack CLI tools, and you need to resolve those dependencies to even get those installed. Um, then you need to consider the image format. Depending on the type of cloud you're running on, you may need to convert that image from, you know, you may need to convert it from QCAL2 to RAW, et cetera. So you now have to convert that image. Um, then once you launch that, generate the key pair, ensure the specs match the size of the image. Uh, the networks, um, if you're using Neutron, you can't put a VM directly on the public network. That'll fail to launch, so you have to put it on a private network. Check the security groups. You know, you have to make sure what ports are gonna be running. You have to make sure those are open in the security groups. And also, if you want to actually access that instance, which you, you probably do, you may have to assign a floating IP address to it so you can actually get to that instance in the end. And then there's you know, a few other options. What do you want to do for disk partitions, customization scripts, et cetera? So I think this is just an example. 
I mean, a lot of us sitting in this room take this for granted. It's pretty easy to do this, but you have to remember if you're coming from the VMware mindset, we're used to that click, click, click. It's not going to be, you're not going to be able to do that exact same thing. So there is kind of a ramp up of, of learning this new environment. So when we start talking about ensuring success, what can you do to ensure success? Some of the best practices that we've had, we're going to go into a little more detail of those, summarizing these. So a lot of it is really planning for the future, and what we mean by that is when you decide on a cloud solution, you want to upfront as much as possible look at the different options, right? Do you want to be responsible for managing it yourself? Do you want to rely on another vendor to handle all that for you? Um, you need to really consider your storage options, your networking requirements, uh, different tiered storage options, because those aren't something you're going to easily add on once you started building that cloud. Um, also planning for things like upgrades, um, expansion, success. If it's going to be a wildly successful cloud, everyone starts consuming it. If you're doing it yourself, do you have you know, enough power in your data center? Are you able to procure the hardware fast enough as it's growing? Can you incorporate those new hypervisors into the cloud? Um, you know, is finance on board? Is security okay with the self-service model that everyone's accessing? And also understanding the scope of operational change. So as we mentioned, um, you know, OpenStack is a much better fit for your more agile mode two applications than your, than your mode one. So is your application such that your application's pretty resilient so it can sustain hardware failures? Kind of going through those tick boxes and ensuring other groups within the company are ready. Like I was just mentioning in terms of, you know, security, finance, the IT operations team, et cetera. Oops. Got it. All right. So I realize we're running short on time. I'm going to speak very quickly. Those of you who know me will know that this is not a problem. Um, <clears throat> what do we have? So OpenStack is not VMware, right? Did we already? We're good, yes. So uh, what, 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 did, what does this mean? What actions can you take to help prevent this issue from causing you problems? So set expectations with ops and with leadership. Let the operations people, let the devs know you're not going to have hardware mediated HA. If a physical host goes down, all the VMs on there go down. Any ephemeral storage that's attached, you may lose all the data that's on that, right? You need to plan for that and build your application accordingly. Um, let leadership know that this is not cheap VMware, right? This is a, a transformational project that is going to change the way that your IT operations function for the better, right? Um, also understand that trying to force these legacy models onto your cloud means failure, guaranteed. Um, plan for adequate staffing. So hire experts. Don't try and cross-train or retask existing staff um, unless you have some really, you know, awesome full-stack engineers. In which case, you know, that that, that may work out. But your general, you know, mid-level uh, uh, sysadmin, VMware admin, they're not going to be able to hack it, right? Um, production equals eight full-time heads at a minimum. <clears throat> Ensure executive sponsorship. So uh, you need to be able to express the value of OpenStack, of private cloud, in terms of, of increased revenue, reduced cost, and reduced risk. That's what leadership cares about, and you need to be able to explain it to them in those terms. You need to ensure that there's a firm commitment from leadership before starting the project, um, both financial and in terms of executive sponsorship, right? Finally, learn from the successes and failures of others. Participate in the community. Come to OpenStack summits. Participate in local uh, meetups, right? Um, and talk to other, other companies. Use your network. You know, use LinkedIn if you need to find some people. Talk to people who've completed similar projects, preferably successfully, right? And, and learn from them, um, people in a similar industry to yours. Learn from them what problems they encountered you know, and how, how they resolved those. Um, so to, to recap real quick, we, we walked you guys through a couple case studies. We talked about the lessons um, that all those people learned. Um, and we talked about how you can learn from their mistakes, what actions you can take to prevent those problems from occurring in the future. Um, we went through the five leading causes of open stack failure, staffing, operational hurdles, time to value, consumption model, and failure to adapt operational models. Um, finally, we went through these, these best practices, right? Plan for the future, understand the scope of operational change, understand that OpenStack is not VMware, plan for adequate staffing, ensure executive sponsorship, and learn from the successes and failures of others. Um, there's a couple of related talks here. If you guys are interested, I'm doing one on OpenStack consumption models tomorrow evening, um, and they're doing one on, on Metapod, which is, or MetaCloud, which is our uh, managed OpenStack offering at Cisco. Um, so if we have time, I'll open it up for questions. Our contact info is up there. If you guys want to email any of us, um, feel free. Any questions from the audience? Can you go to the I'm sorry? Can you go to the yes. <clears throat> 
mm -hmm. take it with a pinch of salt. Um, your recommendation about staffing, when you say don't retrain, get new people, right there I see a conflict of interest with the existing team. They're going to oppose it as much as they can to bring in the open stack to replace VMware if I know that that's going to be. And that's a very good point um, that we encounter a lot of you know, resistance from people because they're afraid it's going to take their jobs. And I don't think you necessarily need to eliminate all your IT staff, but you, you can't you can't train an OpenStack expert from zero. You need other OpenStack experts to train OpenStack experts. You know? and, and I was one of the founding members of Rackspace's private cloud engineering team. Um, we started with five people, you know, and we trained. There's actually a gentleman back there. If you know, he's walking out now, you jerk, who started off as a Windows developer and uh, got trained up as an OpenStack admin. You know? But you, you can't really do that on your own, right? You need other experts to, to help you get to that point. And on the consumption model as well, um, from practical experience, what I have seen is as a first step, you have to draw a parallel and say, what you do today, this is how you can. And then go on to say, OK, this is how you are used to consuming it, but this, can, this is another way of doing it. So to tell them that what you have been doing is wrong and this is the new model of <laughs> consumption, again, is uh, faced with a lot of resistance. Yeah, and I think uh, we'll cover that in a lot more detail in my talk tomorrow, where we examine you know, uh, DIY versus distro versus managed offerings and why you would choose one over the other, what the pros and cons of each are. These, um, so I actually participated in one of the failures, not one of these, another <laughs> one, another very big one that you probably know about. Um, and uh, one of the big reasons was the immaturity of the, of the uh, OpenStack in terms of fit for purpose for, mm -hmm. the, for the product that they were planning to do with it. So I, I'm, I assume that's still true. <laughs> it's, it's good feedback. Yeah, I mean, it, it's, di it's different than what most people are used to using, right? If you're coming from AWS, no big deal. But if you're coming from VMware, <laughs> fair enough. Yes. Uh, I wanted to mention that uh, one of the mes messages uh, you showed, the root is too small, uh, can be avoided by a competent admin yes. by setting a yeah. proper size on the yeah. image. So yeah, absolutely. The uh, all, all of those <laughs> things. No, not all. Yeah. yeah. So the, the, the point is more like if you've got a, a staff of VM, VMware admins who are trying to transition to OpenStack, there's, there's a learning curve, right? There's a. And don't reinvent the wheel. That's a problem everywhere in IT. Um, are they axing us? OK, are we done? All right, thank you guys.